All right. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to Woodland Community Church. Glad you could be here this morning to worship with us. And uh, Pastor is uh, taking a little break from Daniel. We're going to be talking about distraction today. I'm sure none of us need any help with that uh, or some godly perspective on that. So uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm already feeling convicted. So very good. Uh, hey, yesterday was the Harvest Home Farm work day. So uh, just want to say way to go to the people that went and helped with that. And uh, Jesse Shute told me they actually fixed a windmill. So uh, you can ask uh, about more of those projects they did. But great to meet encouragement to Mike and Becky and the ministry there. This week, we also had a big celebration here Wednesday night uh, for the True Seeker kids, and we sent the fifth graders off to middle school youth groups. So just a reminder, if you are a fifth grader, True Seekers is done. There's some youth groupers. Yeah, you get to go to middle school youth group on Wednesday nights for the remainder of the year, and the same thing's happening for eighth graders. Eighth grade, you, uh, you are going to be invited to high school youth group on Sunday night starting tonight. So if you're an eighth grader, you're moving your way uh, to high school youth group for the remainder of the year on Sunday nights um, to, to check that out and see what you're in store for next year. Okay, also today is the last day to sign up for the Louisville uh, T-shirt fundraiser. There's a table in the back just pre-ordering those shirts to help uh, raise money for the uh, kids going to Louisville this summer. Uh, there's also an announcement in your bulletin about the, the choir concert that is happening uh, at the uh, Trinity Lutheran Church in Phillips tonight. Uh, it's titled, I'll Keep My Eyes on the Cross. It's at 7 p.m., um, so you're invited up there for that uh, this evening at 7 at Phillips. And then one more opportunity next Saturday is a work day at Forest Springs. So um, just want to make you aware, you would have to contact camp to register, let them know you're coming uh, as they plan for the project and things. But uh, next Saturday, a work day out at Forest Springs. Okay. I hope that we've communicated clearly and you weren't distracted. You're ready to go. Uh, Matt, help, help get us there. All right. Why don't you stand up? <clears throat> this is one we've done in the past, so we're going we're gonna to review the chorus. Here we go. It goes like this. These are scattered beams. You are the bright sun. These are shallow streams. time Lauren these are scattered beams you are the bright sun these are shallow streams you are the ocean these are just shadows you are the substance we are thirsty we are dry only you can satisfy
ocean These are just shadows And you are the substance We are thirsty, we are dry Only you can satisfy You are the ocean Amen. You can have a seat. Well, good morning, Woodland Community family. Uh, it was great, uh, great to see you all this morning. Sorry we missed last Sunday. Uh, my wife was a little preoccupied. <laughs> but uh, we are so, so joyful to, to have our little Josie Joy finally here. And, um, and mom and baby are doing well. They're at home today, and we'll probably see them next week. So um, this morning, Brian's going to lead us into uh, First Kings, looking at uh, a passage that teaches us a little bit about distractions. And boy, can we get distracted at times, can't we? Um, that sun's coming out, and there's a lot of things that can pull our attention and get us really busy with all sorts of good stuff out there. And so um, my prayer, and I think Brian's prayer for all of us today, is that we just focus in on what, what God really wants to be doing in our lives, focus in on what what he's doing in the lives of those around us and how we can be connecting with them and, and, and giving God our, our full attention. Um, and so as we do that, there's all sorts of people we can be praying for. Um, I think of the LTD class who are graduating today. So one accomplishment to that class. Very good. Um, I also think of families who have little ones that have gone through a year of true seekers and now that we've celebrated the whole year and now we're going to, to summer and um, although there's not regular programming, um, there's a lot of great opportunities for families to continue to, to teach and show faith in their homes and so let's be praying for all those families who we celebrated last Wednesday and as, as, as they, they enter into the school year and, um, and have those different opportunities. I think of our, our Louisville team going down to Louisville. Um, a few of you students here this morning continue to have some of these meetings coming up and just keep praying for that, that group of students as we prepare. Um, have the garage sale coming up here in a, in a month here. A um, couple other things we're doing as a team. So just be praying for that group of students as they prepare their hearts and their minds for this trip. And, and just everyone, we all have things going on in our lives that, um, that God would continue to focus, help us to focus on him and his plan for us. So let, let's go to the Lord and just ask that he would, he would give us just, just a clear vision. Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for being a God who's faithful, who is true, who, who is compassionate and merciful to us. A God who um, sees us and knows our weaknesses and the ways that we fall short a God who um, desires just to pull us up, to draw us closer, and to, to lead us forward. So, Lord, this morning, as we open your word, as we open our mouths and praise, um, may you draw close to us. May we clear our hearts, Lord. We confess that, that we are distracted in so many ways. Um, and we confess that we need to focus on you and make you the number one priority in our lives and Lord, as we focus on you, you will show us a way. You will um, help help get us through just all the things going on in our lives. Um, and, and we will be stronger when, when we put you on the throne and take all those things that, that threaten, um, threaten the, th the throne of our hearts, Lord. And so, Lord, speak to us this morning. Be with all those groups that I've mentioned. Um, we think of the LTD class. Lord, guide and direct those students um, continue to bless uh, just the, the, the studies that they've been doing and the serving they've been partaking in, Lord. Um, allow them to, to transition well to the next chapter of their lives. Um, and and we, just, we pray, Lord, that you just lead us all. Help us to know that you are king and we are just your servants wanting to follow. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Why don't you stand again?
You are not a God created by human hands. You are not a God dependent on any mortal man. You are not a God in need of anything we can give. Not your plan. That's just the way it is. Do that part again. You are not a God created by human hands. You are not a God dependent on any mortal man. You are not a God in need of anything we can give by your plan. That's just the way it is. You are God alone. From before time began, you were on your throne, you were God alone, and right now, in the good times and bad, you were on your throne, you were God alone. You're the only God who's
flying bird at every mountain, every field and valley of the earth. Let all the moons and all the stars in great this love Oh it's moving all my mountains This perfect love is casting out my fear How great this love Oh it welcomes me like family And anywhere I go it meets me there And He is good And He is God And what I heard Is not what I got And He is just Yet oh so kind What I deserve it's not what I find What more could I say about him? My God is love How great this love Oh, it's faithful through my failures This trusted love is with me too
is good. He is God. And what I is not what I He is just yet also oh God. What I deserve is not what I find. What more could I say about it, my God? could I say about him? My God is love. Beautiful. Why don't you have a seat? <clears throat> Before Brian comes to, uh, to share, there are some uh, worship uh, artists, writers, songwriters out there that once in a while they'll, they'll just take straight scripture and they'll write music to it. Just the whole passage, they, they include every word, and, and they just they write a piece. And I found one yesterday <clears throat> that uh, I, th I thought fit kind of the side of what, where Brian is going. And I um, just want to share this with you. And then, uh, Brian, come on up after that. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn above all creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth. The, invis the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions, Rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. Is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. gospel that you heard. Yeah. 
Isn't it great to come to the Lord with his people? Amen. This, is the, this is the high point of the week, and here we are in Easter season. Get a whole season together just to think about what we celebrated last week, which is really where we live as God's people. There is this this wonderful word in the German language, the word Stau. A Stau is basically a blockage or a jam. So a traffic jam is a Verkehrsstau. You get a Stau in your toilet <laughs> when you need to, to plunge it. We've had a Stau here at Woodland in, in all of the wonderful things that we've been communicating you, to you um, that are going on here this spring. And as you remember from about three weeks ago, we were planning a baptism today, but we had a shtow. Um, it was a scheduling shtow. It was a mechanical shtow. It was just a shtow that made us say, hey, this is not the right time to do this. So sometime this summer... Uh, we're going to have a baptism. I don't know if it'll be here or elsewhere, but we're going to plan on that. And if you've trusted in the Lord and have never made your picture of what, uh, of what it looks like to follow him, that outward picture of the inner reality of God's work in your life, you have yet an opportunity to be baptized this year. So that's an invitation as well as a communication about what's going on. Well, this week I, I had one of these medical procedures that they bother you about until you finally do it, and um, I had to go under a general for a few minutes, and when they brought me out, they said, here's the deal, you're fine, so thank, thankfully, okay, but we don't want you to drive today, we don't want you to operate any heavy machinery we don't want you to operate any dangerous tools like chainsaws, and under no circumstances do we want you to preach anywhere from Daniel 7 to Daniel 12. <laughs> so that's a joke. They, that last part they didn't, they didn't say. But when I looked at Daniel 7 in my medicated state, I was like, this is not the week to go into this passage. And uh, so we're going to defer here for a couple of weeks. We're going to talk about, like Michael and Brad said, distraction, which is a great thing to talk about this time of year when we're so prone to wander from our first love because of all the stuff, most of it really good, that's going on in our lives. And then we'll, we'll plunge back into Daniel 7 here in, in two weeks. This time of year always makes me think about spring sprint. When I was a kid growing up, we had three events during the school year. Now I guess there's like, you know, 30 events, it seems like. But we only had three things that we did that were special. There was the Christmas, the Christmas program, which was a full nativity in a, like a non-Christian school, which is interesting to me. You know, we always were all like, who's going to play Joseph? Who's going to play Mary? You know, that kind of thing. So we did that. And then we had the square dance, which was nerve, nerve wracking because you had to dance with the girls and you hoped you got to dance with the girl you liked. That was a big deal. And then we had spring sprint, which was our field day at the end of the year. And uh, my family, my growing up family, has this old video from the 70s and I think it's in color, but there's no sound. So it's like one of those sort of, you know, kind of old real, real to real type videos of me in the running race in spring sprint, and I was a fast kid. So I'm going, you're going around the oval just once, and here I am just, you know, running like a wild animal. I'm way ahead. I was a fast kid, so I'm way ahead of everybody. And then I turn around to see where everybody else is. And I don't just like, you know, do this. I'm like, like total, <laughs> like, you know, running backwards kind of thing. And as I'm, as I'm looking for everybody here, ev the whole field passes me on that side, and I finish last. And when I, when I f finished the race, the principal said, Brian, you got distracted. 
And of course, I took that to the bank, and the next year I was running ahead again. This is not really part of the illustration. This is just a story. I'm running ahead of everybody, and right before the finish line, I fell down on purpose. And then I jumped up and won, and she was like, yes, good job. You know, so I, I knew kind of how to get <laughs> rewarded for, for these things. I wish that I were no longer so distractible. I wish that distraction was something that you and I grow out of. Unfortunately, distraction is always with us, and and the form of distraction changes, and it seems like you learn something in one area of your life, and the distraction just kind of moves around. The poet T.S. Eliot said, we are a people distracted by distraction. And and unfortunately, that is true. Our, Our purpose this morning is to help each other think about what our response to distraction says about where we put our trust and then to prepare for these summer months when we're all in distract when distraction we're in transition and we are so easily distracted in a different routine and it's a very it's a wonderful time but it's a it's a dangerous time and we want to help each other with this. Are we truly trusting God to order our lives? Or does our fiddling around in the world of distractions indicate a self-dependence that needs to be confessed and made right before God? That's the question that we're asking and answering. It's not hard to find examples of distraction in the scriptures. It goes right back to the beginning. Adam and Eve, they, they had God, they had work, they had each other, but they became distracted by an intruder. That's when it all started. Later on in Genesis, you have Lot, the nephew of Abraham, who got the best of the land, but it came, he became distracted by the pleasures of sin in Sodom and Gomorrah, and he lost everything he had. Then you had Esau, who had the birthright and the blessing of the chosen family, but he became distracted by his physical needs. And you can just keep going through these figures in the Old Testament. Jacob, Moses, the entire nation in the wilderness, the nation under the judges, the judge Samson, Eli and his sons, King Saul, even the great King David. Distraction, distraction, distraction. And then we come to the life of Solomon. Solomon is a fascinating figure to me because if you, if you were to choose a king, this is the guy that you would want to have. He, he, he had everything. He was, he, was, he was ingenious. He was a, he was a, a wonderful organizer. He had gifts from God. People followed this guy. People came from around the known world to say, you are a fantastic leader. And after God's promises to David, you would think that Solomon would be the man, the guy that God had chosen to to redeem the nation and save the nation. And yet Solomon became distracted and he fell from a great height. Solomon received wisdom from God. In 1 Kings chapter 3, we read, Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like you has been before you, and none like you shall arise after you. This guy had wisdom from God. Solomon's subjects flourished in his practical wisdom. We read in chapter 4 of 1 Kings, Judah and Israel were as many as the sand by the sea. They ate and drank, and they were happy. It would be great if it just all ended right there, right? They were happy. Solomon also served as a priest king. 1 Kings 8 is really the high point of uh, of, of the nation of Israel. Israel has subdued its enemies 
and the temple has been built and Solomon stands before the people and before God and he dedicates the temple. And this is what we read. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands toward heaven and said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and showing steadfast love to your servants who walk before you with all their heart. That's really the high point of, of the Old Testament there. But then Solomon gets distracted. Our passage today is 1 Kings 11. So if you haven't find it, you found it, you can look around in your, your Old Testament there, find that passage follow along as we read the first 13 verses of 1 Kings 11. And it gets sad in a hurry here. And we're going to read and learn from 1 Kings 11. Here we go. Now Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women, From the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and did not wholly follow the Lord as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemish, the abomination of Moab, and for Malak, the abomination of the Ammonites, on the, eastern, on the mountain east of Jerusalem. And so he did for all his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrifice to their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice, And he had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he did not keep what the Lord commanded. Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, since this has been your practice and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. Yet for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it in your days, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem that I have chosen. This is the word of the Lord this morning. My response to distraction shows my heart. That's the first lesson that we can draw out of this passage. Solomon's desire to order his kingdom through his many wives was revealed in his heart response to distraction. That's the message from the first eight verses. We're told, verses 1 and 2, that he took many wives. Now, ancient kings took wives for a couple of reasons. Usually not romance. Sometimes, usually not. They wanted to show their virility, because after all, they were king. And they wanted to manage their political alliances and their material holdings. So notice the nations who are listed here. It's not an accident who Solomon took as his wives. He took Moabites, Ammonites, and Edomites. This grouping of peoples were the people of Uh, were the people to the east of Israel. They had been subdued by Solomon's father, David. We can read about that in 1 Samuel chapter 8. Then you have the Sidonites 
in the land of Phoenicia. These were the people along the coast to the northwest of Israel, and they began trading with Solomon in 1 Kings 5. Then you have the Hittites, the people to the northeast who traded with Israel in 1 Kings chapter 10. And so he's entered into all these political and economic alliances, and to, to manage his kingdom, he's entering into marriage with the daughters of these kings and noblemen. What had God said about this kind of thing? Well, he said, don't do it. In Deuteronomy 17, so written long before this, even before Israel had a king, God said, your king shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. They'd been told not to intermarry with the pagans of the land. Also in Deuteronomy 7, God had told the entire nation, just not the future kings, but the entire nation, you shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons, for they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. So what's going on here is totally predictable. In fact, it has been predicted. God said, don't do it. And Solomon goes and does it, and apparently nobody asked any questions. Verse 2 to verse 3, Solomon's distraction moved from the material to the spiritual. Notice that shift in the passage. Verses 4 to 8, Solomon's distracted heart condition was not at first revealed. This, to me, is the scariest thing in this passage. When Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God. Think about that for a minute. Solomon served the better part of 40 years, becoming more distracted with his heart growing colder toward God and his things. Remember, his father David had the prophet, prophet Nathan. And Nathan would speak into David's life. Apparently, Solomon has nobody like that. Whereas David had prophets, Solomon has wives. And, and wives from pagan nations. Apparently, nobody got close enough to the king to speak into his life. And, and he went, and as he, he got more and more powerful, his people said, yay, 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 yay. And Solomon was internally dying spiritually, but nobody knew. That's really scary to me. Who are these gods who are list, listed here? Well, they're the, simply the gods of the peoples that Solomon intermarried with. There's Ashtoreth of the Sidonians, who is sometimes depicted holding human heads in statues that we have of Ashtoreth. There's Moloch of the Ammonites who required child sacrifice, which was punishable in the land of, punishable by death in the land of Israel. The proper name of Moloch was Milcah was, and was not even pronounceable in Israel. So terrible was this god. There's Chemish of Moab, the fish god, who is possibly the Moabite version of, of Baal. If we get distracted by the, by the distractions of those who don't love God, we'll eventually love what they love, and our heart conditions will be revealed. And that's really scary to me. What are the distractions of our age? Okay, so we don't have these gods that people bow down and, and, and worship today, but we have gods, right? Right? Our age is set apart from every other age by our reliance on technology, wouldn't you say? Distraction is, you know, goes back to Adam and Eve. But technology is really what sets us apart from every other age. How many of us, this is just for fun, how many of us remember a world without computers? Okay, more, more people than I 
thought. The world moved slower then, didn't it? It really did. I, I actually remember having conversations at the dinner table where I, I told my parents, I think I'm going to not be a, the kind of person who uses a computer. <laughs> you know, if you remember, you know, there seemed to be a choice. You could get a computer or not get a computer. And it was like, kind of like personal preference. Nobody ever imagined then a world in which technology would be a way of life. And I'm, of course, a Gen Xer, and I'm the last migrant, technological migrant generation. Some of you here who didn't raise your hands, you're natives. All right? But I remember going to school with a computer and a typewriter, and everybody was always borrowing the typewriter because the old profs hadn't switched over yet. And then my second semester, I threw it on the curb because I didn't need it anymore. We have technology today like Apple Watches, which are intimate and personal, provides a, a digital body print that measures our pulse, counts our calories, and then tells us what to eat and how much we need to exercise. And if you need insulin, it tells you when to take it, but it's always with you, and there's nothing to say that we can't embed the technology. And yet, the Apple Watch is now old technology. It's been around for, I don't know, what, 10 years? Long time. Now we have the metaverse. You've been hearing about that? It's an entire society existing online that includes things like virtual church, where you can present yourself as an avatar. So just create whatever, create a virtual how do you talk about this? Make yourself into an avatar, like a little cartoon or something, and then you can attend church, supposedly, church, with people from all over the world, and you're all sitting there like little cartoon figures. It, it's a thing. And I'm, I'm hearing about this, and I'm, I'm, I'm frankly shocked at the people that I trust that think that this is a fantastic thing. And of course, I'm thinking immediately about Jesus and the incarnation and how Jesus came body and soul for an embodied experience. And my church attendance needs to be the same way. Body and soul, I need to gather with you. And yet, that's not the virtual church at all. Some futurists are predicting that the day is coming probably in about the year 2050, which isn't that far away, when virtually nobody alive will be able to remember what it's like to live offline. David Wells, who is a, uh, a uh, worldview thinker and writer who's worth, worth reading, he has written, there is no doubt that the pings and the beeps of the internet are highly distracting, but the real danger is what is this doing to us? What is it doing to our minds when we are living with the constant distraction? How do we live in this parallel universe? It's a universe that can take all the time we have. So how do we share our time between the virtual universe and the real universe? What happens to us when we're in constant motion and addicted to visual stimulation? Sherry Turkle is a a scholar at MIT, I don't know if she still works there, but she did about five years ago. Um, she's written books like Alone Together and Reclaiming Conversation. She spent her career studying the effects of technology on people. She's written, we, sit, we, we turn to our phones when we're bored, and we often find ourselves bored because we have become accustomed to a constant feed of connection, information, and entertainment we are forever elsewhere. At class or at church or business meetings, we pay attention to what interests us, and then when it doesn't, we look to our devices to find something that does. There is now a word in the dictionary called fubbing. P-H-U-B-B-I-N-G. I haven't checked, but she says there is. It means maintaining eye contact while texting. <laughs> texting and looking, the vacant stare. It's interesting, um, right before the pandemic, I was reading studies about the, the use or a kid's use of technology. 
and everything was saying, we've got to wean kids off so much technology, it's not good for them. And then the pandemic came, and guess what? We told kids, we want you now to spend all of your time on the screen. So all of your friend time, all of your education, all go to church online, just do everything online, and I'm really scared. I'm afraid we've got a generation of addicts that we are raising. It's a big deal. My response to distraction matters in the midst of all this. Let's go back to Solomon here. Verses 9 to 13. Solomon's desire to order his kingdom through his many wives was met with consequences for himself and for others. Look again at verses 9 and 10 because here here God is speaking. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he did not keep uh, but he did not keep what the Lord commanded. So in 1 Kings 3, Solomon was giving, given wisdom. 1 Kings 9, Solomon was warned that obedience would result in, in an everlasting throne. Disobedience would result in the nation being cut off. And then Solomon disobeyed God, and his response to distraction resulted in consequences. So verse 11 reads quite literally, tearing, I will tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. And then the rest of First and Second Kings describes the severing of the 12 tribes. The northern tribes are dragged off to Assyria and not found again. And the southern tribes were dragged off to Babylon. And of course, we've been reading the book of Daniel which is about what happened in Babylon after that deportation. Solomon's failure to respond to distraction resulted in consequences for himself and for others. But you know what? There's good news here. Did you see it? Even in this passage, I love this about the Lord, as soon as we fall, there are consequences, but there's always good news in the Bible. Solomon's failed response to distraction was met with grace. Verses 12 and 13. There's a trickle of hope here that bubbles up into a brook and widens into a mighty river of grace. This is what God says, verse 12. Yet for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it in your days, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. And this is a reference to 2 Samuel 7, 14, where David was promised an eternal throne that you would think would belong to Solomon, but is actually going to belong to someone else, another descendant of David. Verse 13, however, I will not tear away, tear away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem that I have chosen. Which tribe is going to be spared? Judah, and for a while Benjamin too, but Judah in particular. Who comes from the tribe of Judah? Jesus. There's that little that little trickle of grace that's going to get wider as we approach the time of the Lord Jesus. Solomon failed to respond to distraction, and his failure resulted in a savior by God's grace. At Christmas time, we read Isaiah 11, which says, In that day, the root of Jesse comes from Judah who shall stand as a signal for the people. Of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. The splendor of Solomon's reign and the happiness of his people becomes a, a picture of life under Christ for all those who will trust in Jesus and serve him with their whole hearts. And Jesus, we're going to look at him next week, Jesus as the final 
son of David will not fail his people, but he's going to respond to God, his father, with wholehearted devotion, winning salvation for all who trust in him. So even in this passage, as Solomon has fallen from a great height, you, you, you see Jesus, and we're going to learn more about him next week. What does it look like to respond to the particular distractions of the digital age in a way that shows that we're holy heart, they're wholeheartedly devoted to God? We can read the passage and say, this is what it means, but we still live in this world of distraction. How can we be changed by faith in Christ even as we navigate through it? You know, we deal with technologies that are morally neutral. I waved my smartphone around a couple of weeks ago. I mean, it's a, it's a fantastic device that can be used uh, for the Lord's work and to bring healing and wholeness. Um, it's a morally neutral device. That's how I choose to see it. And, it. and it can be used for good, or it can be used to waste all the time we have and dra drain away all our opportunities. Uh, Douglas Grotheis, who wrote The Soul in Cyberspace, says, everything is a trade-off. A wise person will not shun technology, so you don't have to get rid of everything, but a wise person will ask, what are the benefits? And what do I lose? And what do I gain? And we gain some great things. So for people who really need it, and we all needed it two years ago, we get to stream the service. That's technology. Um, I love hearing from Brad Eitzen about his work with the Afghani refugees. In, in Wausau, he's able to use Google Translate. This blows my mind. And Brad speaks other languages, but he can actually, you can actually speak into a, uh, it's no substitute for learning the language, but hey, how many of us are really fluent in other languages like this? You get to speak in there and communicate basic information with other people. That just blows my mind. People who are persecuted in countries where you, you can't gather with, other, with God's people without being persecuted, they can attend a virtual church. There, there is a purpose in this. It can be used for good. But we also lose some things, don't we? If we're always checking Facebook, Facebook and email and Twitter and Instagram and TikTok, and we develop twitches because we're always like dancing around, um, I don't get that, but that's okay. It could be that we're attempting to order our world in a way that indicates that we're not trusting God to order our lives for us. But even there, we're always being called back to our first love. Revelation 2, 3 and 4 I'd, I'd never read this verse before, these verses before, in light of distractions, but this is what they say. So this is, this is the end of the Bible now. I know you are enduring patiently. This is to the church in Ephesus. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. So the King James says, your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, like Solomon, repent and do the works you did at first. My salvation and yours is not in managing all the realities of my life, but in being changed by faith in Christ. That's what I want to take out of this passage. And my response to distraction is, shows me where I place my trust. So we all get distracted. There's nothing wrong with saying, Lord, just help me to center down. Help me to manage and not be managed by all the distractions in my life, technology and otherwise, and help me to depend on you by faith and then show me what this looks like. And that's where we're all at 
as we head into these summer months. I, I have an exercise in real space for you. Let me share it with you. We're almost done. Here's just, just a challenge or make up your own exercise if this doesn't seem right to you. Here's, here's what I think would be good. Read a book for an hour. Like, really? Like, remember those? The actual books that are made out of paper. And, and like, for an hour. We used to do this. I, I can loan you a book if you need one. All right? Feel your brain relax as it begins to process words and their ideas one at a time. Remember that? When we thought things one at a time. Try it again. You're going to like it. After an hour, take a walk and ask the Lord some questions. How am I doing? Are my affections, that is my heart, being turned so that I'm trying to find my happiness in anything other than you? That's a great question for anything. Do I need to limit my use of technology to put it in its proper place? Maybe I need to shove my phone in a drawer for a meal for an hour when I'm intentionally relating to other people? Do I need to fast from my device? And then finally, build something. Go out and do something with your body, your hands. We've got a, a picture here, Lauren. This is something that happened. The dog is not included in this illustration, but this is something that happened within the last couple of weeks, and appreciation to Henry for being a good big brother. This is Henry and Greta. We were having some technology addiction issues. Could see it in the eyes. Could see it in the elevated heartbeat when devices were withdrawn from people, and we said there, there are better ways to spend this day. And so Henry took his little sister out in, the, in, the, in our little woods, and they begin to build this shelter. This is the early stages of the shelter, but it was fantastic when it was done. They, they built it out of that lattice work, and they covered it with a tarp, and then they put like sod over the top, and, and so it was just kind of invisible. Then, it was, then they were in it, and the neighbor came wandering through looking for his dog and didn't even see them. So they're solving mysteries, out there. This is a picture of childhood to me. This is where I want to live. Okay? Like entire afternoons out in the woods with beautiful weather. And then the weather turned bad. And they were like in the shelter, like weathering the storm. I think this is fantastic. Totally unplugged. I call this primary experience. No screens necessary. And it's a, it's a good thing. And we all need to find ways of, of, of disengaging once in a while and asking the Lord these important questions. Wendell Berry is one of my favorite living authors, and he's written a poem. Um, a mind that has confronted ruin for years is half or more a ruined mind. Nightmares inhabit it, and daily evidence of the clean country smeared for want of sense, of freedom slack and dull among the free, of faith subsumed by idiot luxury and beauty beggared in the marketplace and clear-eyed wisdom bleary with dispraise. That too often defines us, but it doesn't have to. Hold that up against Psalm 46, 10 and 11. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Amen. Know the Lord. Let's know him together. Seek him together and ask him for his wisdom that is dependent on the Lord Jesus Christ. And we will make it through this stuff. And we will ask and answer these questions together and be united in Christ. Lord, thank you. For this passage that's a warning to us about being distracted from all that is true. As we read it on this side of the cross, we, we, we see this as a warning for what happens when we take our eyes from you, Jesus. We want to depend on you, and we're going to fail. We acknowledge that. 
But we ask, Lord, that by your kindness that we see even in this passage, that you'd help us to repent and say, Lord, I want you again. I want more of you. I want to depend on you. And, and I need wisdom to manage things that would take me from you. Help us to help each other. Help us to encourage each other. Help us to remember that our hearts can grow cold, but you're, you're always a step away, Lord. And we want to depend on you. Help us to help each other with this as we trust in you moving forward, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. <clears throat> dismissed enjoy your day